By the end of this lesson, you're going to improve your English pronunciation, vocabulary, grammar, and you're going to feel very advanced with your English. Welcome back to J4S English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. Today, you're going to master the pronunciation poem. This was a poem that was written specifically combining many difficult to pronounce English words. So first in this lesson, we're going to review the poem and we're going to focus only on the pronunciation. Now first, I'm going to show you a line of the poem. I'll highlight that line and I want you to read it out loud. Make sure you read it out loud because after I'll read it out loud so you can compare your pronunciation and then I'll explain every difficult to pronounce word from the poem. We'll do the entire poem from start to finish and focus only on your pronunciation. After in the lesson, we'll review the poem again and we'll look at the vocabulary and the grammar, the expressions. We'll focus on the meaning of the poem. So first we'll focus on pronunciation and next we'll focus on the meaning of the words. So let's start and focus on the pronunciation now. Remember, first you're going to read out loud the words that are highlighted. And then after I'll say them and you can improve your pronunciation. The pronunciation poem. You can say poem, one syllable, or poem, two syllables. Poem, poem. I take it you already know. of tough and bow and cough and dough. The difference is in the vowel sound. Each of these words highlighted has a different vowel. Listen, a, ow, a, o. The vowel is different, but also the gh at the end is different. Here we have a and F. Tough, bow, there is no GH at the end. It's totally silent. And F again, cough, and no GH. It's silent. Do, O. Tough, bow, cough, do. I'll read it again. Of tough and bow and cough and do. Others may stumble, but not you. On hiccup, thorough, laugh, and through. Again, the difference is in the vowel sound and the GH at the end. Here, hiccup. This is the British spelling. In American English, we spell it like this, which the ending is more close to the pronunciation up, up, hiccup, hiccup. But this double C is still confusing because it's pronounced as a k, hick, hiccup, hiccup. So phonetically, hiccup, hiccup, thorough, er, oh, er, er. Thorough, laugh, f with that F, laugh, laugh, through, through. The past simple of the verb throw, through, exact same pronunciation, through, through. I'll read this again. On hiccup, thorough, laugh, and through. Now, don't worry about writing these notes down because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF and you can review this and practice your pronunciation after the lesson. So you can look in the description for the link to download the PDF. Say it out loud. And cork and work and card 
and ward. Here for cork and card, notice both of them start with a k, k sound. The vowel is or, or, r, r, cork, card. Now for work and ward, it's the vowel sound. Here we have a er, 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 were, were, were. Like you're saying, the past simple of the verb to be were, and then you just add a K on it. Were, work, work. Now, ward, this is like the past simple of the verb wear. Yesterday, I wore a sweater, and then you just put a very soft D. Ward, ord, ord, ward. Let's continue. Read this out loud. And font and front and word and sword. With font and front, notice the vowel. We have an aw, aunt. Here we have a uh, unt. Font, front. Ward also has that er, er sound, were. So again, we can take the past simple of the verb to be were. And instead of a K, like work, we're going to put a soft D, word, word. Now, sword, notice the W is totally silent. Ord, or, or, sword, sword. Let's move on. Read this out loud. Well done. And now, if you wish, perhaps. To learn of less familiar traps. Woohoo! Two sentences that were easy. Let's keep going. Read it out loud. Beware of heard a dreadful word. Notice we have E-A, E-A, but in this case it's er, and in this case it's ed, heard. So you can think of it as her, him, her, her, and then just add a D, heard. In this case, you can think of it as ed, the name ed, and then just add a dr, dread, and then obviously full, dreadful dreadful. Heard, dreadful, and we've already learned word. Remember, er, er, word. Let's move on. Read it out loud. That looks like beard and sounds like bird. In this case, the E-A is that long E, ear, like the same as ear or the word beer, beer, and then you just add a D. So E-A-R-D, E-A-R-D, pronounced completely differently. Now they're saying the herd right here, herd, is the same vowel as bird, bird, er, er, it's that er sound. Remember, it's that er in her. So him, her, take that vowel, heard, bird, same vowel sound. You're doing awesome. Let's continue. Read it out loud. And dead, it said like bed, not bead. The word dead, the vowel in it is the same vowel as bed. So we can isolate this to that ed, 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 and then just put a D, dead, dead, bed. But we don't want that long E sound like we have in the word bead, 
eed, eed, bead. I'll say it again. And dead, it said like bed, not bead. Read this out loud. For goodness sakes, don't call it deed. So this E-A is pronounced as the long E, bead. This word, bead and deed, they rhyme because the vowel is the same. Bead, deed. But we have an E-A. So they're saying don't call dead deed because that's wrong. Remember, it's ed, ed. I'll say these two lines again. And dead, it said like bed, not bead. For goodness sakes, don't call it deed. Let's continue. Read it out loud. Watch out for meat and great and threat. Again, we have E-A, E-A-T in all of these words, but the vowel pronunciation is very different. Meat is the same as meat, that long E, meat, meat. Now we have great. At the end, it's ate like the past simple of eat. Yesterday, I ate and then just add a grr, great, great. Now we have threat. Listen to the vowel, et, eh, eh, et. So it's the same as this. If you can isolate the vowel in de before you add the D, it's that eh, eh. So you can think of it as eh, 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 dead, thre, eh, threat, eh, eh, threat. I'll, I'll read it again. Watch out for meat and great and threat. Read this out loud. They rhyme with sweet and straight and debt. Let's review these. Now notice the poem says they rhyme. So if they rhyme, it means they have to have the same vowel sound. So notice here, sweet. This is pronounced exactly the same as sweet, like chocolate is sweet. Notice that long E. Meat, sweet. Great, straight. Now, I put just the number eight because that's exactly how you pronounce it. This eight, yesterday I ate, that is the same as the number eight. Five, six, seven, eight. Yesterday I ate straight. So you just add a str onto the number eight, straight. Now threat, remember it's that eh, 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 threat, debt. I wrote the word debt here so it's easier to see the connection, but it's also on the second line. Now notice the B is totally silent in the word debt. You don't hear it at all. Debt. And it's that eh, 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 debt. I'll read these two lines again. Watch out for meat and great and threat. They rhyme with sweet and straight and debt. Let's continue. Read it out loud. A moth is not a moth in mother. Here the poem is saying that the O-T-H is not the same in the word moth and mother. So here we have an aw, ma, moth, oth. Now this is the same word, a moth, a moth. They're exactly the same. Now mother, uh, uh, ma, ma, mother. A moth is not a moth in mother. Let's continue. Read it out loud. Nor both in bother, broth in brother. 
Let's review these vowels. Here we have an O sound. Both, oath, both. Here, an aw, bother, author. So you can see above, it's that aw in moth, bother, ma, ba, moth, bother. And then we have the same vowel sound as in bother. But you just add an R, broth, oth, broth. And then brother, now we have that uh, uh. So mother, brother, they're both members of a family. You can remember that vowel is that uh, brother, brother. I'll read both of these lines together. A moth is not a moth in mother, nor both in bother, Broth in brother. Let's continue. Read it out loud. And here is not a match for there. Two common words that you already know that also sounds like other common words that you already know. Here, exactly the same as here, ear, here, but here notice the vowel is different. Air, there, air. Now it's the exact same as the possessive, there. Their car is there. Exactly the same pronunciation. Read this out loud. And dear and fear for bear. And pair. So deer and fear have the same vowel. It's also the same as hear. So it's that ear, ear, deer, fear. Now there is also the word deer, which is an animal, but there is no fear. It's just for, for the phonetic spelling. Deer and fear. Bear is that air vowel. It's the same as there. Bear, pair. There's also a pair, a pair of mittens, for example, and it's that air. There, bear, pair, rhyme. Here, dear, fear, rhyme. Let's continue. Read it out loud. And then there's dose and rose and lose. So here, dose and rose have the exact same vowel sound. It's that O, but the S-E is pronounced differently. Dose s, with an S, rose. Z, z. So you hear a, z, a buzzing because it's a voiced sound. Dose, rose, and here we have a Z at the end, it buzzes, but you have a different vowel. It's a OO, lose, z, lose, lose. And then there's dose and rose and lose. Let's continue. Read it out loud. Just look them up and goose and choose. Let's compare goose and choose. So the vowel is the same. It's the same as lose, oo, goo, chew. But it's the difference between that S, the unvoiced, and then the Z, the buzzing, the voiced. Goose, choose, goose, choose. I'll read these two sentences together and then we'll continue. And then there's dose and rose and lose. Just look them up and goose and choose. Read it out loud. And do and go, then thwart and cart. Here we have do 
and go. Notice oo, do is more like the goose, choose, lose. But then we have o, go, like dose or rose. Do and go. Oo, o. And do and go, then thwart. So here, this is not an R sound. It's not thwart, art. Like the R in cart, it's a or thwart, ort thwart. So you could think of it like or, and then just add a T, and then wart thwart, and then of course with our R car, easy one cart, and do and go, then thwart and cart. Read it out loud. Come, come! I've hardly made a start. That should be easy for you, but just notice the come is actually a a、uh、sound in the vowel. Come, come, and then start and cart rhyme. Come, come! I've hardly made a start. Try it out loud. A dreadful language. Man alive. We already talked about dreadful. Remember, is that a、uh, a、uh, dre dreadful? Alive. Notice it's the lie lie alive alive. Read it out loud. I'd mastered it when I was five. So here. Easy for you, right? We have five, which of course rhymes with alive. So th this is an easy way to remember pronunciation: is to find a word that is your word you know how to pronounce. You know how to pronounce five. So now, when you think of alive, you can remember that vowel sound in five, and you can apply it to the word. A dreadful language, man alive. I'd mastered it when I was five. Our last two lines. You can read this one first. Read it out loud. And yet, to write it, the more I sigh. Of course, write is the. Is pronounced the same as right, the opposite of wrong, but in this case, it's right. The W is silent, so phonetically, it would just look like this: right, right. Now, sigh. It's the vowel sound in I, I, and then just add a s, sigh, sigh. And yet, to write it, the more I sigh. Our last line. You can do it. Read it out loud. I'll not learn how until the day I die. First, let's look at learn because we've talked a lot about this e a pronunciation. We've seen it in many different forms. Here, you can think of it as a u,、uh, earn, u,、uh, more of a u、uh、sound, or you can just think of the vowel is just not even there, and it's l u earn. Er, earn, learn. Whatever is easier for you to remember the sound. Learn, learn. I'll not learn how until the day I die. This is pronounced the same as the word die. And notice all of these have that same I I sound in every single one. Alive, five, sigh. Die. Sure, the beginning is different, the end is different, but if you isolate the vowel in all of these sounds, it's that same I vowel. And you did it. That's the pronunciation poem.
Now I'll read the poem from start to finish and you can focus on the pronunciation and make sure after you practice reading this out loud and focus on all the individual words as well. So I'll read it from start to finish. The pronunciation poem. I take it you already know of tough and bow and cough and dough. Others may stumble, but not you on hiccup, thorough, laugh, and through, and cork and work and card and ward, and font and front and word and sword. Well done, and now if you wish, perhaps, to learn of less familiar traps. Beware of herd, a dreadful word that looks like beard and sounds like bird. And dead, it's said like bed, not bead. For goodness sakes, don't call it deed. Watch out for meat and greet and threat. They rhyme with sweet and straight and debt. A moth is not a moth in mother, nor both in bother, broth in brother. And here is not a match for there, and dear and fear for bear and pear. And then there's dose and rose and lose. Just look them up and goose and choose. And do and go, then thwart and cart. Come, come, I've hardly made a start. A dreadful language, man alive. I'd mastered it when I was five. And yet to write it, the more I sigh, I'll not learn how until the day I die. Amazing job mastering that pronunciation. So now let's move on and focus on the vocabulary, the expressions, the grammar, because I'm sure there were a lot of words that now you know how to pronounce them, but you don't know what that word means. So let's focus on that and we'll review the poem in detail and focus on the vocabulary. Let's do that now. The pronunciation poem. I take it you already know. Right here, this is a really great expression. I take it you already know. The expression is I take it. I take it, and then you need a clause. A clause is just a subject, verb, and then maybe an object if necessary. So the clause is, you already know. This alone is a complete sentence. You already know. I take it, you already know. I take it in this case means I assume. I assume you already know. So for example, let's say you see your coworker and she or he looks really, really happy. You could say, oh, you look happy. I take it you heard about the bonuses. Now, this is the reason why your coworker is really happy. And by using I take it, you're saying, oh, I assume. I assume you heard about the bonuses and this is the reason why you're really happy. Now, you could use this with a negative emotion. You look sad. I take it you heard about the layoffs, which means you might lose your job. So you can use this in any, with any emotion, and it means the same as I assume. You can also use this in a more everyday social situation. For example, I take it they're going to the party. I assume they're going to the party. So remember, this is our clause. The clause doesn't have to be with a you, but generally the subject is I. I don't hear this very much with we take it, she takes it. So for now, I would recommend using it with I take it, I assume that. Let's continue. I take it you already know of tough and bow and cough and dough. Okay, tough, this is another way of saying difficult, difficult. We also use it as an adjective to describe someone who is very physically strong. She's really tough. He's really tough, which means like Physically, they can handle themselves in, in situations where they need to handle themselves physically. 
Now, so you might use it more in a sports context where it's important for an athlete to be tough, like another way of saying strong. But in a more everyday you and I usage, it means difficult. Oh, that exam was really tough. That exam was difficult. Now, remember this poem is specific for pronunciation. So they're choosing words to show you how pronunciation changes. This word, I had no idea what it was and I had to look it up in the dictionary. The pronunciation is bow. Let me write that, bow, which is the same as this motion, what I'm doing. Let's say you're, you're meeting the queen or the king or royalty, you would bow when you lower your head and your upper body. I can't do it fully because of the microphone here, but you get it. You bow. Or before you pray, you would bow your head to pray in some cultures. So that's bow. Now, what is, that's the pronunciation, but what is this? It's a large branch of a tree and bow. I had no idea. A large branch of a tree. I have never said the word bow in my life, nor do I think you will. So just ignore this. But I did teach you what bow means. <laughs> Cough. <laughs> Dough is a mixture of flour, eggs, water that is used to make bread, pasta, many other things. So it's the mixture before it becomes the bread or the pasta. You have the dough. So those are the ingredients combined together, but they're not cooked yet. They're the raw ingredients. Let's continue. Others may stumble. Now, when you stumble, let's say you're walking and then you maybe move in a weird way or there's an uneven surface and you trip a little, but you don't fall, but you almost fall. You call that a stumble. So, whoa, but you don't fall. <laughs> so to walk in an awkward way and you almost fall, but you don't fall. Now, we also use this with languages when you make a mistake, especially with speaking. Oh, I always stumble on my words. So just like you're walking and whoa, you almost fall, you're speaking and you, you can't think of a word, you say the wrong word, you mispronounce a word, you can say, I stumbled on my words. I hope I don't stumble on my words during the presentation. I wrote that there for you. Others may stumble, but not you. And honestly, if you're speaking during a presentation and you do stumble, don't worry. You just need to move on. Okay, let's continue. On hiccup. Hiccup. Let me read these first. On hiccup, thorough, laugh, and through. Okay, so remember these were for pronunciation. I'm sure you know what they mean, but... Do you know what hiccup means? Just remember in American English, this is spelled hiccup, which is a lot easier to guess the pronunciation of it. So when you hiccup, you make a, a noise in your throat, but it's unintentional, which means you don't want to make it. And often the noise will happen every 10 seconds, 20 seconds, every 30 seconds for a period of time, maybe 10 minutes or five minutes. This is a hiccup. <gasps> <laughs> that's the hiccups. So we say, oh, I have the hiccups. I have the hiccups. I actually get the hiccups quite frequently. I have the hiccups. I'm going to use the American spelling. I have the hiccups. Now, uh, I don't know in your culture, actually, this is an interesting point. In your culture, do they have a, a remedy for the hiccups, a way to get rid of the hiccups. So, oh, I have the hiccups. What would your friend or family member or coworker tell you to get rid of them? In North America, at least, generally we say, 
drink some water. Oh, I have the hiccups, drink some water. That will get rid of them. But we have this other remedy where when someone has the hiccups, you're supposed to scare them and then they're supposed to get rid of the hiccups, likely because <gasps> when you're scared, you take in a really, really big breath and that probably big breath of air helps to clear your throat and get rid of the hiccups. So if you have the hiccups in North America, someone might try to scare you. <laughs> Does that exist in your culture? Okay, so on hiccup, thorough. Thorough means completely. So you could say, I, I had a thorough conversation with my boss. So you had a complete conversation, a full, a detailed, you discussed absolutely everything you needed to discuss. We had a thorough conversation, discussion, meeting. Now, this is commonly used in the adverb form. So you could say, um, we discussed the issue thoroughly, thoroughly. You could also add it here because adverbs are flexible. We thoroughly discussed the issue. To be honest, you can remember it here because it's always easier to remember that adverb verb and that's correct most of the time. So let me change the placement for you. We thoroughly discussed the issue. We had a thorough conversation. So this is an ad adjective, adjective because it modifies the noun. Conversation is the noun. And then we have the adverb. It is more commonly used as an adverb than an adjective, but obviously it's possible. And remember, this is specific for pronunciation. Let's continue. I'll highlight these for you and then we'll continue. And don't worry about taking all of these notes because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF. So you can look for the link in the description to download the PDF. Let's continue. And cork and work and card and ward. Okay, cork, this is a cork. It is the top of a wine bottle. So this is the top of a wine bottle. I have a lot of these in my house because my cats love playing with these. I throw them and they go crazy for them. And they don't play with any of the expensive toys I've bought for them. They play with a cork that I got for free. <laughs> so this is a cork and work and card and ward. A ward is an area of a hospital or a prison, likely other things as well, but these are the two that I'm familiar with. For example, there's a, a children's ward in a hospital, so an area of the hospital that's only for children. During the pandemic and likely still today, there's a COVID ward. There's an area of the hospital specific for people who have COVID. And honestly, I don't know what the different areas of a prison are. I don't know much about prisons. However, this is interesting. I just thought of it because the, the, the person in charge of a prison is called the warden, the warden. And that's probably where that word came from. Ward, warden. I never thought about that because like I said, I don't think about prisons too frequently, but warden, ward. The warden is the person in charge of the entire prison. They're like the CEO of the prison. Okay, let's continue. And font and front and word and sword. I don't think there's anything you wouldn't know here. Well done. And now if you wish, perhaps, perhaps is another word for maybe. They mean exactly the same thing. Perhaps the only difference is, ah, maybe the only difference is, is that perhaps is a little more formal. 
I wouldn't necessarily say it's the formal version of maybe, but it just sounds slightly more formal and maybe just sounds every day. Maybe does not sound slang or informal at all, but when you see them side by side, it sounds slightly more formal. Otherwise, it's the same meaning. Perhaps I'll go to the, the party. Maybe I'll go to the party. To learn of less familiar traps. A trap, this is a useful expression because it represents a difficult situation without an escape. An escape meaning you can't get out of that difficult situation. For example, when I was a kid, I would often complain to my dad that I was bored. Oh, I'm bored. I have nothing to do because I wanted him to entertain me or suggest a way to entertain myself. But every time I said that, oh, I'm bored, I have nothing to do, he would always say, well, I have some chores for you to do. You can clean the floors, you can vacuum, you can prepare dinner. And he would always give me something obviously a kid does not want to do. This is when I was 13 years old. And of course, I don't want to do chores. So that's the difficult situation, having to do chores, cleaning the bathroom, the kitchen, and there's no escape. How can I escape it? I just told my dad I have nothing to do. So I can't say, oh, actually, I have homework because I just told him I don't have anything to do. So I have no reason not to do the chore. So after I can say, oh, I can't believe I fell for that trap. Now to fall for it means that you weren't expecting it to happen. So this could happen in a, a situation at work where maybe you're telling you, your coworker says, oh, do you have any plans after work on Thursday? And you say, oh no, just going home, just going to watch a movie, nothing to do. And then your coworker could say, oh, well, I really could use your help on finishing the report. And since you don't have anything to do, why don't you help me? And then you could say, I can't believe I fell for that trap. <laughs> so it's a fun expression that you can use. Okay, let's continue. Beware of heard a dreadful word. That looks like beard and sounds like bird. So of course, a beard is the hair on a man's face. Well, not all over his face, just in a concentrated area of his chin. That would be the beard. That looks like beard and sounds like bird. And dead, it's said like bed, not bead. Okay. A bead, this is used to make a, a lot of jewelry. Uh, you could use it to make a pillow or, or other items as well, but the individual balls and you can put them through a string and you can form a necklace or you can form a bracelet. Those would be beads. It's way easier to explain with a picture. <laughs> so here are pictures. This is an individual bead. And then you use many beads to make a necklace, make a bracelet, or make some other art and craft. Generally used to make jewelry, but like I said, you could make a pillow entirely out of beads. Actually, I believe there are some beads on the very colorful flower pillow behind me. I believe there's some beads as well. So that's a bead. I'm sure you own some beaded jewelry or beaded items. I think every single person has something made out of beads or has made something out of beads at one point in their life. For goodness sakes, don't call it deed. This is an expression, maybe you've heard it, for goodness sake, is used to express either a positive emotion or a negative emotion, but 
it is more used in in negative emotions, frustration, annoyance. Let's say you're with a friend, a coworker, husband, wife, family member, and you're at a, a store that sells jewelry all made out of beads. And the person you're with is taking a really long time to pick out a necklace. And after 20, 30 minutes, you say, for goodness sake, just pick a necklace. So you're using that to show your frustration, your annoyance with the situation. Now, in the poem, it has it in the plural form, which I do hear. But just know that it is more common in the singular form. And technically, there is a possessive in the writing because the sake belongs to goodness. So technically, there's a possessive here, but you wouldn't hear that in pronunciation. And generally, it's in the singular form. For goodness sake, just pick a necklace. For goodness sakes, don't call it deed. Let's talk about deed because you may have heard of a good deed. You should do good deeds. A deed is simply an intentional act. So an action that you do intentionally, which means on purpose, you plan to do it. Now, some people, and I think this is an amazing initiative, is they try to do at least one good deed a day. So they try to do something positive for another person and they do it intentionally on purpose every single day. So maybe you're at the grocery store and you see an elderly man struggling with his groceries and you could help him take those groceries to the car, to the car. And then you could say, I've done my good deed for the day. You don't technically have to say good. I've done my deed for the day. But because deed can also be a negative act, we generally specify my good deed. I try to do one good deed a day. I try to do five good deeds a day. Why limit it to one? <laughs> I've done my good deed for the day. Watch out for meat and great and threat. So remember, we're focusing on vocabulary. I don't think there's anything we need to discuss for vocabulary. They rhyme with sweet and straight and debt. Okay, sweet. This is a room at a hotel. They refer to that as a suite. I booked a suite for three nights for example. So I booked a room at the hotel for three nights. I booked a suite for three nights. Now, we also use this to identify an apartment or condo building, usually for mail purposes. So let's say your, your address is on Main Street. This is the name of your street. And it, your apartment building, your condo building is 100 Main Street, but you live in suite 304, which means apartment number, unit number, suite number 304. So generally that's on the third floor and it's the fourth unit, the fourth suite on the third floor. So we also use this for apartments and condos. Apartments, condos, and hotels to say the unit. A moth is not a moth in mother. So a moth is an insect, an insect with wings, like an ugly butterfly, I guess. Not to say it's ugly, the poor moss, but compared to a butterfly, it's not as beautiful. They're usually white or brown and they have wings. So I'll just write that for you. Insect, flying insect, flying insect. They really like light, like most all insects. So they're the ones that are always around your lights when you're trying to go to sleep, maybe a moth. A moth is not a moth in mother, nor both in bother, broth, 
in brother. So again, for pronunciation purposes, but broth, this is the liquid used to form a soup. So you could have chicken broth, which is the, the liquid in your chicken soup, or it doesn't have to be chicken. It could be anything. It could be vegetable broth, meat broth, mushroom broth. It can be a specific type of vegetable even. So that's broth, the liquid generally used to make soup. A chicken broth, liquid in soup. Broth. So you can say, mmm, this broth is delicious. Did you make this broth yourself? And here is not a match for there and deer and fear for bear and pear. Okay, again, I don't think there's anything for vocabulary here. And then there's dose and rose and lose. Okay, so dose, this is a medical term and it's how much the quantity of a medication. That's the dosage. So you could say I'm on a low dose of aspirin. So dose is the measurement of that medication. So maybe that represents a hundred milligrams, but the person wouldn't know whoever you're talking to. So you would have to, if you wanted to know, you would have to ask them, oh, how much is it? But it's just the measurement used for medication. And then lose, this is of course the opposite of win. So opposite of win, for example, we lost the game. That's the past simple. We lost the game. Just look them up and goose and choose and do and go, then thwart and cart. Okay, let's talk about thwart. Thwart is a verb and when something thwarts something, it prevents it from happening. For example, the rain, the rain thwarted my plans. Remember thwart is a verb. So here is conjugated in the past simple. The rain always thwarts my plans. So here is conjugated in the present simple. And this is the something, the rain, and this something prevents, which is the verb thwart, something else from happening. The rain thwarted my plans. The rain always thwarts my plans. Come, come, I've hardly made a start. Hardly is another way of saying barely, barely. So it means a small amount. If I say I've hardly made a start, it means I have made a start. To make a start just means start. <laughs> There's no difference here. So you can say, to put it in an easier to understand way, started. I've hardly started. I've barely started. So you have started, but just a very small amount. Sometimes students will say, I hardly worked this weekend. Now, this actually means I worked a small amount this weekend, a very small amount. But what they actually wanted to say was I worked hard this weekend because they forget that hard is the adverb. So hardly does not mean hard. Hardly means a small amount which is actually the opposite of hard. So English can be confusing with pronunciation, but it can also be confusing with vocabulary. So if you want to impress your boss, don't say, I hardly worked this, let's say week instead of weekend. I hardly worked this week. Your boss will be very upset if you say this. You want to tell your boss, I worked hard this week. This will impress your boss. So I'll write that just so you remember, I'll write not a lot, not a lot. 
So a small amount of, that's what hardly works. I'll write that here as well, because barely hardly means the same thing. A small amount of or not a lot, whatever is easier for you to remember. I did a small amount of work this week. I did not a lot of work this week. I hardly worked this week. I worked hard this week. You worked a lot this week. That's what this one means. A dreadful language. Let's talk about dreadful. This is the second time we're seeing it, but I didn't explain it at the beginning. A dreadful language. Dreadful means very unpleasant or very bad quality. So here, a dreadful language, the poem is suggesting that English, the English language is very unpleasant because of how difficult it is to pronounce and also because of how difficult vocabulary and grammar can be as well. A dreadful language. Hopefully you don't think that about English. But you could say, for example, the movie was dreadful. Your friend asks you, how is the movie? Dreadful, which means very unpleasant. But remember, it also means bad quality, poor quality. So if someone asks you, how was the restaurant? Now, you could say the food was dreadful to focus on the quality of the food. But you could also talk about the quality of the service, the, the service was dreadful. The decoration was dreadful. So there could be different elements, but we'll just say food or service, the two most common ones. The food was dreadful. We use this to describe the weather a lot. Oh, the weather was dreadful today. It thwarted my plans. The dreadful weather thwarted my plans. So I hardly worked. Ah, we're using all of it together now. Okay. A dreadful language, man alive, I'd mastered it when I was five. And yet to write it, the more I sigh, ah, that's a sigh, ah, I sigh, ah, okay. And yet to write it, the more I sigh, I'll not learn how until the day I die. Okay, notice here, I'll not learn. So this is a contraction. I will, but let me write this for you. I will, I will not learn how until the day I die. So this is correct. I will not learn how, but when we form a contraction with the future simple in the negative, we don't form it like this. This is considered outdated English. This poem was written a long time ago. So at the time of the poem, I'm sure that this was modern usage of the word. But today, this is not modern usage. It's grammatically correct, but not used today. So it's outdated. It's not modern, not used today. You should not use it. It will sound awkward. You should say... I, do you know what you should say? <laughs> I won't learn how, I won't. So this is the modern usage of how we form a contraction today, use today. So again, if you say this, sure, you'll be grammatically correct, but you will sound very weird. Don't say it. Say, I won't learn how until the day I die. And if you ever forget, just don't use the contraction and say, I will not learn how until the day I die. So now you know both the pronunciation of the pronunciation poem and you know the vocabulary in the pronunciation poem. So now you can say, oh no, English isn't a dreadful language. You just need to learn it. And you have a great teacher, hopefully you think so, a great teacher to help you master it. So now you've mastered the pronunciation poem. Amazing job. Think of how much you've learned today, how much you've improved your vocabulary, your pronunciation, your grammar, your expressions. You've done all of this in this lesson. Amazing job. You should feel very proud. To celebrate your accomplishment, put Woohoo! Put woohoo in the comments. Put woohoo to celebrate your success. You deserve it. 
And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And why don't you keep improving your English with this lesson right now?